So aerodynamics is something that often seems really, really complex. A little while ago, I put up a video breaking down the absolute basics you need to know when it comes to cycling aerodynamics. If you wanna check that out, I'll put it above and down the description as well. But how do we then translate that to the field? How do we test some of this? And how do we get some practical takeaways? That's what I'm gonna show you today. I'm gonna to head down to the velodrome with one of my athletes, Zach. He's a 70.3 triathlete, absolute gun. Just recently did a 4.11 at Geelong and we're building to Melbourne 70.3 in the next couple of weeks. Looking to some really exciting things for him. He's an absolute gun and an athlete, an absolute great guy too. So well, I'm gonna head down to the velodrome. We'll catch you there, we'll pick it up. And we'll take you through the process of working through how we can improve some of our aerodynamics on the bike in a really practical, simple way. So we're down here at the velodrome. I've got Zach rolling around, just doing a bit of a warm up. We're gonna do some aero testing for him out in the field. So ideally we don't wanna get this done in the indoor velodrome. You're actually gonna see him come past in a second. We're just getting through, like I said, a little bit of a warm up. There he goes. But what we're gonna be looking at is largely some positional things that we can do. We're not gonna be changing too much on his bike per se. I think we've got that reasonably dialed in. We've had him bike fit correctly. Um, all the components have changed. The major things we're gonna be looking at is the difference between the current helmet he's got on. So he's got a cask Mistral on and his older long tail uh, aero helmet as well. What is the difference? Is uh, one faster than the other? And then the other thing we're gonna be working on is some technique side of things. How he can sink his shoulders down a little bit better, drop that front, drop his chin, which is ultimately gonna drop his front end a little bit and try to get a little bit more aero. So he's just going to finish up a warm up here. I'm going to get him to a few little uh, little clips so you see him rolling around. Then we're going to head back, uh, back home. We're going to download, analyze some of the data and take you through how you can interpret it. So we're about to head into our first pass. So it's really important that we do this in a controlled environment. Doing these aero tests out on the road, not the best way to do it unless you've got a dead flat, uh, uninterrupted stretch of road. Getting around on the velodrome is the best way to go. As much as there's wind, it's going to be a headwind on one side and a tailwind on the other, so it sort of compensates in that regard. So he's about to head in. We're going to do three laps on each pass, about 1,500 metres. He's about to get going with a warm-up lap uh, and then a, a slow-down lap after each of them. So we're just testing normal position with his newer of the two helmets. Um, have a look what's going on. We'll film a little bit of what his, uh, what his side-on looks like as well. Largely, the key things I'm ticking off through this process are how well does his equipment, particularly when we're looking at helmet, how well does that integrate into the rest of his body? Because that's ultimately what's going to give us that aero advantage. Does the tail of the helmet sit nicely between the back of the shoulders so we get that nice smooth airflow? Of course, sitting in a wind tunnel and testing all this would be great when you don't have access to some of that stuff or it's really expensive, you can't get there. This is the, sort of the next best thing. So it's a really practical way of understanding some of this data. So he's about to get going into uh, into his first pass now. So we finished up our passes with the helmets. The first thing I identified was in both helmets, we actually saw a little bit of a gap opening up between uh, the back of the helmet and top of his shoulders. So what we're not getting is that nice smooth airflow from, uh, I guess, over the top of his head and down his back, which is ultimately gonna cost us some time. We actually noted in the longer tailed helmet, back of the helmet was actually lifting up as a result uh, of increasing some speed. So you can see him going past here. We're just working on now back on the first helmet, which we think is gonna be the fast one and what felt like the more comfortable helmet as well. We're just working on dropping the shoulders, getting his chin forward a bit to allow him to sink down a bit and smoothen out that, that gap. And I might actually put some uh, pictures up on the screen to show you that difference. I'm just watching him as I talk to you here, but um, watch that difference in terms of the gap between his shoulders and the back of the helmet. That's ultimately gonna save us some time. So he initially thought maybe this was gonna be um, a way of him losing a little bit of power. It feels like a little bit cramped up. But what we're interested in is we'll have a look at the data at the end. Did he lose speed? If he lost power, that's okay, but as long as we went just as fast, because that sort of tells me that we are more aero and we're changing some of that aerodynamic component. So we're gonna keep testing, keep looking at all the different components that are going on, but another pass through here, that is already starting to look a lot, lot better. I'm interested to see his thoughts when we, uh, when we have a chat to him in a second. So let's keep testing a few different things, keep working on that technique side of things, and then we'll break down the data at the end when we're back. 
back, downloaded the data, uh, got Zach to upload it to Training Peaks, which is what you can see here. So uh, we did some error testing. You can see at the beginning, this was all at the velodrome, uh, these little sections here, they're all separated. You can see the big gaps where we're obviously talking through what was going on, um, making some of those changes, particularly the positional one. You can see there's a big gap here where we're talking about that. A little bit of a practice run at the end for Zach, just to get used to it before he went out and finished his ride. And then we actually caught up for coffee. So there's a bit of a delayed uh, data analysis away from all the data upload. I just wanted to show you how we're sort of breaking it down. And this is a very oversimplified version of how you would break down someone's aero data if you're gonna do some field-based testing. I mean, it's not perfect, it's not foolproof. We're not directly measuring CDA. We're not directly measuring what was exactly going on with the wind. And yes, there was a headwind on one side of the, the velodrome and a tailwind on the other. We're just trying to get some like enough of an insight to see some significant change because at the end of the day, he's going to be out on the road, racing in conditions, outdoor. So we want to see what, what actually happens when he's out on the bike and, and rolling around. Can we make some change and, and then track that over time? This is a key thing. We've looked at an isolated scenario here. Can we now track that over time and see are there improvements going into racing? Like some of these changes, are they practically usable and applicable? Might be great on a velodrome when in those conditions we used, but when we actually get out on race day, maybe aren't they, are they making a difference or not? So you look on the right-hand side here, I've highlighted this, this first effort, so to speak. So we did three laps of the velodrome. It was about 1,600 meters in the end. Um, you can see normalized power 293 watts, held an average speed of about 44.4 kilometers per hour. So this is actually probably just above his race pace, but we were quite consistent with our effort. Um, in terms of RPE and, and things like that across the across the session. I just wanted to show you that, and, and I'm actually broken down the data, and this is probably an easy way to look at it. I've, I've taken out the three segments just to really highlight those key numbers and make it easier for you to see on the screen. We obviously tested his new helmet, which is a cask Mistral, uh, for those interested. Uh, and then we tested his new helmet again, but we changed some body position stuff as we talked about before. So we did 1.6K on each of these laps. And I've just taken these straight from the, the, the training peaks data and, and the lap data. So I haven't gone in and edited this in any way. I've just ripped the numbers straight out. Normalized power across the three trials. Let's have a look at helmet, helmet choice first. And I've talked about this before in terms of the basics of aero. Helmet is one of those big key components. Getting that right and the interaction with the helmet to the body is really, really critical. Both the helmet choices left a bit of a gap between the shoulders and that's where we're ultimately punching similar power. 293 normalized power for the new helmet, 300 for the old. Obviously, if we're going about the same speed, that would be great, but we've lost about 1K an hour in terms of speed. The larger, longer tailed helmet, the old helmet was actually creating a bit more drag. And I learned that not only from looking at the vision, looking at the photos, um, eyeballing it from myself and seeing him go past, but also Zach sort of then reported to me immediately after that initial test of the the or the test of the old helmet, he reported to me that he could feel the helmet lifting up at the back, like it was creating lift. Sometimes we want to create lift. That's what your disc wheel does. So Zach was riding a disc wheel on the velodrome. Your disc wheel is going to create some lift and allow you to propel forward a little bit easier. And that's why disc wheels are so fast. We don't want to have that happening on your helmet because that's pulling your helmet up and ultimately, particularly the back of the helmet, if I spin my cap around, if you think about this as an aero helmet, that's being lifted up and up and up and up. Sometimes you see if there's, a, if there, if there's any looseness to the helmet, it's gonna be up here, which is actually creating some more frontal drag uh, over the top. So that's where we're seven watts higher for actually one K an hour slower. Not a great combination. Probably more inclined to stick with that new helmet uh, and he actually really liked it. We just want to see how that sort of impacted. A little bit of trial and error in this process. So if you're able to get access to a helmet where you can test it first, might be quite useful. But this is as simple as we need to do to break it down. Clearly, an increase in power, reduction in speed, it's not gonna be an optimal solution for us. We want maximal speed, less, least amount of power, fundamentally is what aero uh, is trying to do, ultimately reduce our exertion, so we, and but still maintain how fast we're going. Then we flip back. So we put the cask back on, and that's what this one on the right-hand side is here. We then tested some body position changes. So then I was interested in that component I mentioned just before of the gap between the back of the shoulders and the helmet. We wanna minimize that, and the way we do that is trying to drop the chin forward and also sink into our shoulders uh, a little bit more. Now in his current, uh, current position, he'd been tweaking a few things on his bike. We actually need to make some equipment changes, bring his, uh, bring his extensions up and his arm cups up a little bit, bring his saddle back up a little bit to help get him into that position a little bit more comfortably. For him, that's a very individual change that we're making. But what I wanted to highlight here was that even in a not as optimal for, for that trying to get into that really low position and, and sort of tuck himself down a little bit, even though it wasn't the most optimal setup on the bike side of things, have a look at the, the numbers that we were producing. We're at 43 and a half kilometers per hour. So 
almost the same as what our old helmet in not trying to do anything with our body. Just jump on the bike, get comfortable, and worry about worry about the helmet that, that's on our head. We got the same speed result for 258 normalized power, which is a significant drop. We're talking what 40, 42 watts different for 0.1 of a kilometer hour faster just by changing his the way his body was shaped on the bike. We're not changing, we didn't change anything in terms of saddle height, we didn't change any equipment, we didn't change the aero extensions, we didn't change his race suit, we didn't change his uh, we didn't change his helmet in this one. We had the same helmet as the beginning. The the only thing we the, the, the only thing we've done in this trial, and obviously the new helmet here wasn't as fast because we've had that wattage drop. That's the other thing to highlight. But the only thing we've really changed in this trial was try to sink down and get yourself a little bit lower, get that chin a little bit forward, and just sort of start to reduce your own um, frontal area. Basically, try to narrow yourself a little bit more. The main thing we take away from this is we're starting. To, we we weren't able to produce the number the amount of power that we could or wanted to, and that obviously made us a little bit slower. But if we combine similar power output to better optimized position when we make some of those adjustments and tweaks to the bike, we're now going to be getting a little bit, a little bit further up in terms of speed. You can see we're not far off, and about 0.9 of a k an hour, better part of almost 40 watt drop in terms of power. Imagine what happens when we can get that power back up there, but we're also in that little bit more compressed position, if you like. That's sort of the basics of what we went through. Hopefully, that gives you a little bit of an insight. Um, in terms of how simple this process can be. Again, this is gonna be applicable to the, the day of testing we had. Yes, there's so many other variables like air resistance and how, how high of an altitude are you at and all these things. But I think what the purpose of this video is is to highlight that we can aero test quite practically and you can get some reasonable insights. Um, if you're not sure, feel free to reach out, ask a question, chuck it in the comments down below, get in contact with me, um, head over to my website, chuck me an email if you wanna ask more about how I go through this process. I like to get this really simple. Of course, we can go really top top end, next level, measure CDAs and a bunch of other fun stuff. At the end of the day, if we are establishing that we're trying to get more aero, if we're producing the same watts for more speed or producing less watts for the same speed, those those two are hand in hand of we must be, we must be more aerodynamic. We must be reducing our resistances and overcoming them easier to keep things moving along. So as long as we can identify some of that data, and we can see that over time, test it again and again and again, see how practical it is in racing. It's all very well to be the most aero person in a wind tunnel, but if you can't translate it out into the road, it's no good to us. And that's why I think sometimes for the average person, and even for someone like myself who's got a reasonable background, I'm not a I'm not a physicist or anything like that. And so aerodynamics isn't my number one number one thing that I focus on. But I think sometimes we can get caught up in the really complex stuff. Keeping it simple can be really, really effective. I mean, some basic numbers here, but we can see some clear improvement. Let's keep tweaking and refining those. Hopefully you got to be out of this one. Like I said before, any questions, please leave them down below. Always love to hear them. Hopefully you got to be an insight into my coaching process as well. Um, and yeah, we'll leave it there for today and we'll see you in the next one.